Hey chemistry, um, sorry this video is coming to you a little bit later than usual. It's been a heck of a morning, um, but it's good to be with you all again. Um, and so today we are going to talk about liquids and solids. So this is not a math heavy chapter at all, but there are a lot of concepts that I'm about to cover, um, especially vocab words. So stay close, pay attention, um, and learning the terminology is what's going to help you this chapter. Okay, so we're going to start with liquids. Um, in chapter three, you learned that what defines a liquid is that it can um, take the shape of its container, but that its volume is fixed. Its volume doesn't change uh, no matter what container you put it in, right? If you pour water from one glass to another, you still have the same amount of water, um, but you, it's now, it might be in a different shape, um, okay? So liquid cannot expand to fill its container like a gas does. Kinetic molecular theory predicts the constant motion of the liquid particles. Individual liquid molecules don't have fixed positions. That's why I have a glass of water. That's why it can move around. It's not fixed. But if I took, say, a tape dispenser and did the same thing, there's nothing internally moving in the tape dispenser. That is fixed. But a liquid, the molecules are not, or in a solid, they're mostly fixed. But in a liquid, they still move. So let's talk about density. At 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of air pressure, liquids are much denser than gases. Uh, the density of a liquid is much greater than that of its vapor in the same condition. So water is denser than water vapor. Hopefully kind of a duh moment. Um, the higher density of liquids must be traced to the intermolecular forces that hold the particles together. Liquids can be compressed, but the change of volume for liquid is going to be a lot smaller. You can't compress a liquid nearly as much as you can compress a gas. Um, so density, compression, fluidity. All right, let's write some of these down. Density, compression, and now we'll talk about fluidity. So fluidity is the ability to flow. Shocker. Gases and liquids are classified as fluids because they can flow. A liquid can diffuse through another liquid. Um, so think if you put food coloring in water, like the picture shown on page 396, it's going to diffuse through. But a liquid moves more slowly than a gas at the same temperature because the intermolecular attractions interfere with the flow. So liquids are less fluid than gases are. Think about it. Um, if there's a leak in the basement water pipe, the water's going to remain in the basement. Right? It's not going to magically go up. But if there's a leak in um, a gas pipe, that gas pu can diffuse throughout the entire house. It wouldn't just stay in the basement. Not that we know that much about basements because we live in Florida and Florida doesn't usually have basements, but you get the general concept. Um, okay, so now we'll talk about viscosity. So if you've ever heard the phrase that slow is molasses, that has to do with the viscosity of a material. Um, so viscosity is a measure of the resistance of a liquid to flow. So the more viscous it is, the less it's going to throw. Uh, flow. Sorry. Can you name a viscous liquid? If you said syrup or anything like that, pudding, that would work well. Yogurt. Um, the particles in a liquid are close enough together for attractive forces to slow their movement as they flow past one another. The viscosity of a liquid is determined by the type of intermolecular forces involved, the shape of the particles, and the temperature. The stronger the attractive forces, the higher the viscosity. Uh, if you've used glycerol in a lab, which we haven't so much, um, but you would know that glycerol is a super viscous liquid. Um, but size and shape of particles can also affect viscosity. Um, so think about the kinetic energy of a particle. It's dependent upon its mass and its velocity, so how fast it's moving. If the molecules in liquid A are more massive than the molecules in liquid B, um, then liquid A's are going to move more slowly than liquid B because bigger things move slower, right? Uh, molecules with long chains have a higher viscosity than shorter, more compact molecules. Um, again, bigger it is, slower it's going to move. Um, also, viscosity decreases with temperature. If you've ever had um, a blizzard from Dairy Queen, they can turn it upside down and it doesn't spill out. That's because it's so cold that it's not, it's very viscous. Um, but as it warms up, um, as it starts to melt, it becomes more viscous, right? Um, so with that said, hopefully viscosity kind of makes sense. Let's talk about surface tension. So surface tension allows bugs to walk on water, like the picture in page 398 of your book. Um, surface tension also is why you can put water droplets on top of a penny. I'm sure you've done that experiment before. We would, you know, do it in class if we were in class, but if you want to, you can take a penny and you can drop little drops of water on top of it, and you can fit a lot of drops of water on top of a penny, and the little bubble grows and grows. 
Um, intermolecular forces don't have an equal effect on all particles in a liquid. Particles in the middle of a liquid can be attracted to particles above them, below them, and to the side. Um, but particles at the surface, there's no attraction from above to balance the attraction from below. So there's a net attractive force pulling down. That means the surface has the smallest possible area, so it's stretched tight. Think like the head of a drum. Um, and then it takes energy to overcome those attractions. So the energy required to increase the surface area is called surface tension. Surface tension is a measure of that inward pull by the particles. It what keeps the surface strong. In general, the stronger the attraction, the greater the surface tension. Um, water has a high surface tension because its molecules can form multiple hydrogen bonds, right? We talked about that uh, yesterday. Drops of water are shaped like spheres because the surface area of a sphere is smaller than the surface area of any other shape of a similar volume. So that's why whenever you do anything, it's always a, um, it's either, it's drips like that, but ultimately your drops of water are always going to be spheres, right? Um, so it's difficult to remove dirt from clothing or skin using only water, and here's why. Here's why you need soap. Dirt particles cannot penetrate the surface of water drops. And unless the water, so let's say you have a piece of dirt and then you have water. What you're doing if you're only using water is you're just putting water on top of the dirt and around the dirt. The water is never actually, the dirt never is penetrating the surface of the water molecule. And so the water is never able to absorb the dirt and then take it with it, you take it with it when it gets washed off. Um, when you add a drop of detergent, soaps and detergents decrease the surface tension of water because soap actually disrupts the hydrogen bonds between water molecules. When the bonds are broken, the water spreads out, and so that is what enables it to grab dirt. It also is what enables it to grab germs, so make sure during this time you are washing your hands with soap, not just water. Um, any compound that lowers the surface tension of water is called a surfactant. So now let's talk about capillary action. All right, so capillary action. When water is placed in a narrow container, such as a graduated cylinder, you've seen that the surface of the water is not straight. It actually forms that concave meniscus. So I'll draw it. So here's your graduated cylinder, and here's your meniscus. That's what the water looks like. Now, we know that we measure from the bottom of the meniscus, not the top, whenever we're calculating a measurement. Um, but why does it do that? Two words, cohesion and adhesion, okay? Cohesion and adhesion. Cohesion is the force of attraction between identical molecules, so water to water. Adhesion is the force of attraction between different molecules, so water to glass, okay? So cohesion is water to water. Adhesion is water to glass. Those are examples. Um, together, these things, so if you have um, a narrow enough cylinder, together, cohesion and adhesion are actually going to help draw a thin film of water up the narrow tube. Narrow tubes are called capillary tubes, and the movement of a liquid up, of them, up them is called capillary action. And capillary action depends on the cohesion between the water molecules and the adhesion between the water molecules and something else. Okay, um, so let's move on. Let's talk about solids. So this was all liquids. I'm so sorry. I titled this liquids and gases. It's supposed to be liquids and solids. I read that wrong. I told you. It's been a day. All right. Solids. According to the kinetic molecular theory, one mole of solid particles has as much kin kinetic energy as a mole of liquid particles at the same temperature. So by definition, solid molecules still are in constant motion. But why does solid have a definite shape? Why does it have a definite volume if all of the particles are still moving? For a substance to be solid rather than liquid, there must be a strong attractive force between the particles. Um, there is more order in a solid than in a liquid. Your particles are more going to stay in the same place-ish. They're moving, but they're staying in a similar order. So, we'll talk about density of solids. So we're going to kind of go through some of these same things. Um, in general, the particles of a solid are more closely packed, so most solids are going to be more dense. That's why a lot of solid things, when they're dropped in water, they sink. Think about like your phone. 
It's a solid. It's denser than liquid. It sinks. Um, so most solids are more dense. When the liquid and the solid states of the substance exist, the solid almost always sinks. Can you think of an exception where the solid state of something is less dense? If you said ice, you're correct. Um, water is less dense as a solid, and it's one of the only things that is. Um, most things, most solids are going to be more dense than their respective liquids. So let's talk about crystalline solids. So one of the reasons why ice is less dense is because its molecules are packed together in a predictable patterned way. That's a crystalline solid. It's any solid whose atoms, ions, or molecules are arranged in an orderly, geometric, three-dimensional structure. So it could be um, a cube, it could be a triangle, it could be all sorts of fancy things. It could be a dodecahedron for all you want, but it's predictable and it's geometric. You see some examples of crystalline um, solids on page 401, and those are actually the seven categories that most solids are going to be. Orthorhombic, tetragonal, cubic, triclinic, hexagonal, uh, rhombohedral, and monoclinic. You do not have to have all of that memorized. But look and you can see the fact that the molecules are going to be packed in these geometric shapes. Okay, um, So a unit cell falls under that. And a unit cell is the smallest arrangement of connected points that can be repeated three-dimensionally to form the lattice. So in something that is made of a whole bunch, let's see if I can do this, in something that's a whole bunch of these cubes, a unit cell would be one cube. There you go. Artwork for you. What do you do? Um, okay, so the shape of a crystalline solid is determined by the type of unit cell from which the lattice is built. So whatever shape that is, is going to help create the shape of the crystal. Um, so you can kind of look again at the different shapes and you can see that depending on what shape the unit cell is in, the crystal is going to be in a different shape. So calcite um, and barite and fluorite all grow and get created in different shapes. Okay. So crystalline solids can be classified into five categories based on the type of um, particles they contain. Atomic solids, molecular solids, covalent network solids, ionic solids, and metallic solids. You should be able to tell just from the names what type of unit cells they are. So an atomic solid is going to be elements that are only bonded to themselves. They're not molecular. They're, there's no covalent bonds other than the atoms being bonded to themselves. Okay, molecular solids is going to be specific molecules, so that's going to be a lot of water things, um, things made out of carbon dioxide. Covalent network solids are things like diamonds or quartz. Um, uh, ionic solids are anything, um, any solids bonded only by ionic bonds, and then um, metallic solids are things, they're, they're metals, they're bonded by metallic elements. Um, so to kind of go through that one more time real quick, uh, molecular solids, the molecules are held together by dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, or hydrogen bonds. The things that we learned about yesterday, right? Most molecular compounds are not solids at room temperature, even water. Um, molecular compounds such as sugar are solids because of their large molar masses, but with large molecules you usually have weaker attractions, okay? Covalent network solids, carbon, silicon, they all form multiple covalent bonds, are able to form these network solids. Um, in chapter 7, we talked about the structure of diamond versus the structure of graphite, how they're both made out of carbon, but they're structured differently. Um, they kind of give you, those are different allotropes of carbon, right? Um, and so, one question that is actually in your Junipod is looking at quartz. Do you think quartz is going to be more similar to diamond or more similar to graphite, and why? So you might have to go back to chapter 7 to look at the difference in allotropes between diamond and graphite, okay? Um, ionic solids. Each ion in an ionic solid is surrounded by ions of an opposite charge, right? So you have a positive ion surrounded by negative ions, and all those negative ions are surrounded by positive ions. 
So they continue attracting each other, right? Um, the network of attractions extends through the ionic crystal and gives these compounds high melting point, a lot of hardness. These are very strong, but they're very brittle. These are the things that shatter, but they're strong. Okay, so um, it's something that will shatter, but it's something that still is strong. Metallic solids, um, positive metal ions surrounded by a sea of mobile electrons like we talked about in chapter 8. The strength of the metallic bonds varies between metals, and that's why in a lot of metallic solids you have a wide range of, of melting points, boiling points, so on and so forth. Okay, and then amorphous solids. Amorphous solids. Amorphous not morphed, uh, is one in which the particles are not arranged in a regular repeating pattern. The amorphous comes from Greek, it means without shape, um, and an amorphous solid often forms when a molten material cools too quickly to allow enough time for crystals to form. Um, so there's an amorphous solid example in um, figure 1321, um, you see wire, obsidian. Glass, rubber, and other plastics are amorphous solids. Um, recent studies have shown that glass may have some repeating structure. When x-ray diffraction is used to study glass, there appears to be no pattern, though, to the distribution of atoms. Um, when neutrons are used, an orderly pattern of silicate units can be seen. So they're trying to eventually produce glass that conducts electricity, which you can decide if that's a good idea or not, but that's what they're aiming for. Um, so that's the end of today. It was a lot of vocab to throw at you, but hopefully you're able to supplement this with looking in your book. You do want to look through your book. You want to see these definitions, see examples of stuff as we go. And then you have a Junopod that's again, very conceptual. Um, so good luck. Uh, that's not due till Friday because today's lesson is coming so late. So you do have some extra time to work on it. Um, but good luck with that. And, uh, it'll be great. Let me know if you have any questions. Bye guys.